Ben, Red Premac, Jazz Video Guy, Jazz Video Go Live, May 6, 2020. Got a special guest today, talk about that in a second here. But in the meantime, some sad news. Uh, a member of, of our community is, uh, I don't want to say he's on his deathbed, but he's having a hard time, and that's the guitarist Pat Martino. Uh, some of you know that uh, a bunch of years ago, Pat had an an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm, and uh, he lost his memory almost completely. He had to relearn how to play. Imagine that, you know, this masterful musician spends years performing, has an issue, and then has to start all over again. Well, he did, and uh, some of his best playing has been the past decade or so, but unfortunately, on a tour of Italy, he developed a lung infection. He's had problems since uh, uh, the aneurysm with his lungs, and he's on oxygen 24 and 7 right now. So hopefully, uh, let's all send our positive energy and vibrations to Pat in the Philadelphia area that he can uh, beat this and uh, return to uh, full-time playing, because we certainly uh, love the way he plays.
Yeah, a little Horace Silver there, played by a man who plays a lot of different music. Let's welcome Jeff Coffin. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Brett. How are you, man? I'm great, man. It's great to have you here. Jeff is joining us today from his home in Nashville. And in case you don't know Jeff Coffin, you should. He's played with Bella Fleck and the Flecktones, the Dave Matthews Band. Uh, he's an educator. He's done probably hundreds and hundreds of clinics. He teaches at Vanderbilt, lives in Nashville, and uh, he is uh, a man who is part of the jazz tradition, but he's, he's also an activist. Jeff's not the kind of guy who sits around and waits for something to happen. He makes it happen. Jeff, how are you surviving during this weird time we're going through? Yeah, you know, everything has been okay, man. Um, my wife and I are staying healthy, hunkered down, isolating. And I've been spending a lot of time in this room. This is, uh, this is my studio here. And uh, so I've been spending a lot of time here, hanging out, making music, and uh, sending stuff all around the world to, to get it recorded on, and sending stuff to uh, New Orleans and Brazil and uh, New York, um, different parts of the States, uh, using a lot of musicians here in Nashville, of course, remotely recording. Um, but you know, it's it's interesting. It's it's um, interesting to kind of nav navigate the new reality, and uh, you know, it's challenging. It's challenging. Uh, I'm I'm missing my friends. I'm missing making music with other people. Um, but I've been I've been working on a lot of different stuff. I'm in the middle of I don't know twenty some odd tunes right now that that I'm recording, and some are some are finished. Some are almost finished. Some are at the earlier stages. Um, I put out an EP a couple of weeks ago. I've been doing live streaming uh, every Friday from my studio. Um, ITAstudiostreams.com is that website. And so raising money for local musicians. Um, uh, when all is said and done, we'll probably have about $10,000 raised. And uh, sorry, we'll have about $10,000 raised for uh, local musicians. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been okay. It's been okay. Let's look at something that uh, that you've done recently. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, that was SBOU. Jeff, tell us about that. Uh, well, that's a tune that I wrote a number of years ago when I was over in Espoo, Finland, uh, with Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. We had just come from, um, um, I don't even know where we'd come from. We are somewhere in Europe, and we ended up in Espoo, and uh, uh, we were in the van going to the hotel, and I asked who was, who was playing um, at the festival, and they said Sonny Rollins was playing. So I said, let's go to the festival. And so we all went, and it was unbelievable, incredibly inspiring. And uh, um, the next day when I was practicing, this tune just kind of fell out. So every time I play it, I think Sonny, you know, not only his presence but his spirit, and, and certainly that night in Finland uh, that we got to hear him. Uh, I got to, to see and hear him four different times, I think, um, something like that. Every time it's been unbelievable. Here's a question from uh, one of our viewers. How do you develop the tone you hear in your head? Um, well, that's a great question. I, I, I personally believe that we all have our own personal sound, always. If I go back and I listen uh, yeah, to um, recordings from, you know, even like early college or, or late high school, um, there's still a sound there, you know, and and examples that I use to to sort of to 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 kind of push that theory, I guess, uh, is that you have people like Robbie Coltrane who don't sound anything like his dad. You know, you have Felix Pastorius who doesn't sound like Jocko, and so that's as close as you're ever going to get to the real thing is the the blood relative of the son uh, or daughter, of course, um, but. You know, I, I think we're all, we all have our own sound. We're all built differently. The, the shape of our jaw, the size of our tongue, the, the size of the aural cavity, the, the thickness of the bones. So I believe we all have our own personal sound to begin with. Now, to develop that, you have to do things like long tones. You have to work on fundamentals. You have to work on uh, figuring out how it is that you hear music. A lot of that is through composition, through improvisation. Um, through understanding uh, the the um, the vertical nature of harmony, as well as the horizontal nature of music, um, understanding the arpeggios. I'm actually working on a new book right now that's that's dealing with some of these really fundamental elements of improvisation. Um, sort of kind of understanding the bones, the structure of the arpeggiations. Um, so it's, it's through a lot of listening, it's through imitation, and there's so many different ways that, that this is done. Um, uh, I've always said that through, through imitation comes originality also. I think that, that playing a lot of different styles of music, working with a lot of different styles of musicians, um, practicing, obviously, you know, thousands and thousands of hours, um, trying to be as authentic as you can be, in whatever given style. So if I'm playing, if I'm playing a funk tune, or I'm playing a New Orleans tune, or I'm playing a swing tune, or a rock tune, um, I'm trying to be as authentic as I can in all of those different styles um, because I've listened to it because I'm interested in a lot of different kinds of music. I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different cultures of music, and uh, um, this this thing of, of ten album covers in ten days has been floating around Facebook and. So I got nominated the other day, and, and so it's been a lot of really different stuff. I mean, my first thing was Otha Turner, and then I have, um, I had a Love Supreme, um, Umu Sangare, um, Ornette Coleman was today, um, Johnny Griffin, introducing Johnny Griffin was the other one. So those are the five so far. That's some pretty wide listening, you know, and so I've always listen to a lot of different stuff, a lot of African music, uh, Brazilian music, um, um, folk music from around the world. One of my favorite websites is folkstreams.net, and I'll put that up here in the, uh, in the comments also so you all, you all can check it out. But it's an incredible site where you can stream all these folkloric documentaries, um, people like Peg Leg Jackson and Otha Turner, um, um, Ghanaian fishing music, music from Appalachia, 
Um, uh, there's some less blank films that are up there, uh, all sorts of really incredible stuff. So I've, I've dug into that over the last 30 years and I really love it. Yeah. Here's an interesting comment. <clears throat> Jeff, you sound wonderful as always. I recall Richmond high jazz band. You were in the one o'clock and we were lucky to have you student teach us for a semester. Two oh, I remember that. Curling etudes. Yeah, was was uh, was this student was bass player? Were you in the uh, were you in the band? I don't know. I guess so. The uh, bass man. I don't know if he's in the band or not. It says uh, we were lucky to have you student teach us for some. I guess he must have been in the band. No, I remember that. I was. Uh, it was the the um, the spring of nineteen ninety, and uh, and I had to drive about thirty five or forty miles each way from Denton, Texas to go to Fort Worth. And uh, in my, in, in the roads were God awful, man. They were, they were digging up the roads and I had a, a 79 Canary yellow four door Toyota Corolla with no air conditioning in it. And, uh, um, and so when I left, when I left Texas, uh, that was my last semester in school. And I hung around for a couple of months. And then when I left Texas, um, my car was in such bad shape. I was running on three cylinders and so I would have to like start going up a hill at about 75, 80 miles an hour and then head to the breakdown lane and end up at about 30 or 35 by the top of the hill. Wow. And my car was going because I was rolling running on three cylinders and, and the engine was doing this, right? Because of all those rough roads that had loosened up the, the engine bolts. So literally, literally, oh, he was playing second alto. Okay. Um, uh, so, so when I... When I got home to Maine, um, my dad was what my my dad had the car checked out for me, and I was literally there was one bolt holding the engine into the car. Wow! And that was loose. <laughs> so so I remember those trips to Fort Worth very well in Richland High School, and uh, um, you know it was great. I, I loved working with those students, and uh, um, yeah, it was it was really fun really fun another question what was the transition to pop rock concerts like for you second part who arranges the live horn parts is it rr or you uh okay so the first part what was the transition like um pretty seamless to be honest with you um it was when i got called to to start playing with dave matthews in 2008 when the roy had his uh atv wreck uh, I had less than 24 hours, and uh, so I was in New York at uh, at a friend's wedding. My gear was in Nashville, and the gig was in Charlotte. Uh, um, uh, yeah, in Charlotte the next night, and uh, so I didn't really have time to think about it. Um, more so than saying, you know, I need staff paper, I need a three ring binder, plastic sheets, a bunch of pencils, and a pencil sharpener, and. Uh, so Rashawn and Dave came in early. Rashawn and I sketched out the parts um, and uh, basically got enough tunes for a set list together. So, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I've, I've played a lot of different styles of music my entire career. When I, was, when I joined the Flectones, um, you know, that kind of got me into a lot of odd metered stuff. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of more fusion-ish kind of world music slant on things. But, uh, but I mean, I was already into playing funk and, and R&B and all that kind of stuff before. So, so the transition wasn't that tough. And uh, we had sat in before with Dave Matthews with the Flectones. We had done a bunch of opening dates. Um, so, yeah, the transition wasn't, wasn't really hard. I mean, you have, to, you, know, you have to have your fundamentals together. You have to be a great listener. And, uh, and I'm a great listener. I know how to do that. That was one of the skills that I bring to the table. And um, I have a good tone. I play well in tune. Um, I have good articulation. I have good rhythm and time. I understand harmony. So those are the five fundamentals of music. So as long as you have those together, man, there's not much that's going to, not much that's going to throw you if you understand your role in the different styles of music. You know, um, understanding how to be as authentic as possible. Understanding what your role in the ensemble is. And, uh, and, and so I understand those things. I've made a career understanding those things. And uh, 
Uh, the other question, uh, who arranges the stuff? Rashawn does a lot of the arranging, but we collaborate on a lot of things together also. Um, so it kind of depends. There's some, there's a, there's a tune called, um, um, oh God, what is the name of the tune? Uh, I guess uh, some, uh, something bird, some, some, uh, not bluebird, but anyhow, there was a tune that he and I both wrote arrangements on for one of the records. And we liked both of the arrangements. And then Dave said, well, just, you know, just for shits and giggles, let's like hear them together. And it was crazy, man. They it worked together with both arrangements in the tune, which is which is how we left it, and uh, um, which was pretty cool, actually. Here's a follow up from Mike. He wants to know: thirty thousand kids is different than playing in a club. It it is different. It's it's different in so many ways. Playing in front of thirty thousand people is very anonymous, actually. Playing in a club is 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 way more exposed to me. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, when, when there's 30,000 people in the audience, it's, I don't know. I mean, it just feels anonymous on, on a lot of different levels. Um, the energy, of course, is, is very different than if you have, you know, a hundred, couple of hundred people in a club. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I will say this though, the intimacy of the ensemble is the same. I, I've always said to people that, uh, playing with with Dave Matthews in front of these large crowds is like having a seven piece small group in a club because of the intimacy that that exists between all of us as friends, as musicians, um, as creators, um, as improvisers. So there's a real intimacy within the ensemble, and uh, and and there are nights when I'll look across because I'm far stage left. I'll look across the ensemble. And, and I'll watch everybody breathing together, undulating together. And, uh, and, and in those moments, like you really recognize the power of music. And uh, um, so, yeah, and, and my goal is always the same, too, whether I'm playing for, you know, 25 people or 25,000 people. My goal is always the same. And that is at the end of the night for me to have felt like I've been in the audience and the audience to have felt like they've been on stage. It's a very reciprocal thing that's going on. And, uh, and, and, and I really do feel that way. I feel that music is, is, is very much a service industry, that we have to serve the music first. Uh, second, we serve the musicians on stage. Third, we serve the audience. So I'm at least fourth on that list. You know? But by serving those others, by serving the music, the musicians, and the audience, by serving all that, you in turn get served. And uh, so again, reciprocal. Here's a question from Mickey Spillane's cousin, Ed. How do you personally <laughs> memorize and learn tunes? Um, repetition. It's repetition, listening and repetition. When I, when I learned the Dave Matthews Band catalog, uh, and, and also before when I learned the Flectones catalog, which was much fewer tunes in the Flectones catalog at that time, uh, maybe 40 or 50, you know, um, the Dave Matthews catalog was about 150 tunes. And th the thing about that music too, is that it's asymmetrical. And what I mean by that is that, that what Rashawn and I play in chorus one, for example, will likely not be what we play in chorus two, or it might be that it goes on for an extra two bars or an extra bar. It, the music is asymmetrical. It's very unique. And uh, um, so when I when I learned all that music um, for a month, uh, for three to four hours a day, I had my iPod and my headphones, and I would just play along. I would just put it on uh, on repeat, play along, and uh, and try to get so that I wasn't seeing the music in my head, that I was hearing the music coming along. You know, because as long as I'm seeing the notes and the patterns in my head, I know that it's not completely memorized yet and uh so that's that's where i have to get to here's a question about the flectones jeff joining the flectones was the perfect move for that band opening new ways for the music how did it come about uh well thank you for that um yeah i spent 14 years with the flectones and love those guys you know they'll always be family and 
we all stay in contact and it's great. Uh, we're, we're great, great friends. Um, um, how did it come about? Well, you know, I used to run a jam session here in Nashville after I moved to town for about nine years. And there was a drummer who came in one night named Tom Pollard. I think Tommy still lives up in New York. And he ended up calling Bela and said, hey, there's a tenor player in town uh, or a sax player in town. I don't think you know about. Uh, you guys should connect sometime. So I was out. This is a strange, convoluted turn of events. This is why one of the reasons I believe that everything is connected. Um, I was in Aspen, Colorado with this guy named Max Carl, a group called Max Carl and Big Dance, and uh, um, Five Horn Band. And I was up early one morning having coffee with my friend Bill Fanning. And we, we saw that the Flectones were in town. And I said, wow. I said, man, so we should go, go hear the Flectones tonight. I said, if we can find Vic, you know, I, I said, I bet we can get some tickets. And so literally within a couple of minutes, Vic is walking down the middle of the street right at us. So we hang and, and I knew Vic from Nashville, of course. And, and he said, oh, yeah, he says, come out, come hang. And so uh, during the set break, I wasn't sure if I was going to stay for the whole night or not. Um, I went downstairs to say thanks for the tickets. Um, met Bela and, and he looked at me and he said, wow, he says, I have a message to look you up when I get home in Nashville, which I thought was very strange because I didn't know that Tom had called him. And uh, I said, well. Cool, man. Okay. He said, well, you know, I'm in gig mode. Can you stick around till the end of the show? And, uh, and let's chat. So we did, we hit it off and he said, well, look, let's, you know, let's get together when I'm home and play a little music together and, uh, you know, just hang out a little bit. And that's how it started, man. It, it started through a friendship and we played a bunch of stuff. I was into a lot of Ornette's music at the time, Ornette Coleman. And, uh, um, I was writing. So I, I brought in some of my original music. He asked me to come down and sit in one night at a place called Cafe Milano here in town and uh, played the whole night with him. Stuart Duncan, the great fiddle, fiddle player, was supposed to play. Stuart was not able to make the gig. His daughter had the flu. So I played the whole night. And I remember taping uh, Sunset Road that I had written out on a napkin, the tune Sunset Road, on a napkin to the, to the microphone stand to play it that night. And we played some Ornette stuff. It was a couple of Christmas tunes because it was December. And uh, a couple of blues they had, I think Royal Garden Blues and some other stuff. Anyhow, it was super fun. And, uh, um, you know, he's, Bela made the comment, oh, I heard Future Man go to some places I've never heard him go tonight. Because we kind of got into a little bit of Elvin Train stuff. And, and I was like, oh, that's cool, man. I said, it was really fun. He paid me, which I didn't expect. And uh, um, a few days later, he called me up and asked if I would be interested in doing a few dates with him in, in 1997. And uh, that turned into a 14-year tenure with that group, um, the last two years of which I did both bands. Wow. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. You know, one yeah. thing that, uh, that happens with the Dave Matthews Band is that you sometimes have special guests. I'm going to play a oh, video yeah. for, from a recent guest, and we'll talk about this remarkable man after the clip. Okay. Oh, where did the clip go? The clip... The clip man. Oh, hold on a second. All right. The clip disappear. Okay. I don't know where that clip is. Let's watch another clip. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, Ross on. <laughs> God. <laughs> Unbelievable. So a little circular breathing there. For those who are unfamiliar, what is circular breathing? Circular breathing is where you're breathing in through your nose uh, as you're breathing out of your mouth. Um, so, so, so basically, you're, you, you've got back pressure. It's a steady stream of air coming out of the mouth. Uh, you hear it a lot when, when people play didgeridoo also. And, uh, um, um, and some saxophone players um, use it. Uh, brass players will sometimes use it also. Um, Roland Kirk, <clears throat> well, let, let me first say that I, I feel that Roland Kirk um, gave all of us permission to try whatever we want to try. And uh, his, his influence is um, deep and spectacular and profound and any other adjective you want to come up with. Um, it's hard to believe that he did all that while not only being blind, but at the end of his life, he was in his early 40s, I believe, when he passed. He already had a couple of strokes and was playing with one hand. And he would have three horns around his neck uh, and... I think at the end, like he was able to still play too during because of certain mechanisms on the horn that he had built. Um, so incredibly inspiring. And so, so he would do it. So, so sometimes for me, when I, when I watch and listen to him, I, I almost start to hyperventilate because I'm like, Oh God, he's not breathing. And, and a lot of times I find I breathe with the music also. And uh, um, so it, it, it's incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm in awe every time I hear and, and see him play. Yeah. Now let me see. I think I located this clip that uh, okay. I couldn't find before. Thank <laughs> you. 
Amazing. With Forest Flower, reached a, a whole new audience. And then some 50 years later, he played with the Dave Matthews Band. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, well, we have, you know, different guests throughout the year. And we've had, uh, you know, bunches of folks um, from Nicholas Payton, Greg Osby, uh, George Garzon, uh, David Sanchez, um, um Oh, God, Herbie Hancock's come out and sat in, and, you know, a bunch of John Faddis also, uh, Ron Blake, uh, et cetera, you know. So anyway, so uh, we were talking about different guests uh, a few years back uh, of who to bring out. I said, man, I said, what about Charles Lloyd? And everybody was like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's have Charles Lloyd come out. And so uh, so I got in touch with Dorothy, and uh, um, I still have Charles's message on my phone <laughs> that I that I probably will never erase. And uh, um, so so we talked and I, I kind of told them what was up and, and they were like, okay, and, and made whatever arrangements were necessary, uh, you know, with, with management. And uh, so we were playing in, in San Francisco. He was in Mountain View. And so he came and, you know, he came to soundcheck, came early in the day, hung out, he was there the whole day. Uh, I've got amazing pictures, Brett. Unbelievable, unbelievable pictures. And and that night when he played, <laughs> uh, you know, we don't really talk about the guests very much after they've after they've guested. You know, it's great and we hang and blah blah blah. We move on. But you know, Dave talked to me a number of times about Charles, and uh, um, and he had you know he had a very emotional reaction to it, as did I. And uh, um, and I was wondering, you know, how our audience was going to react to it. 
and man, they went crazy. They went crazy, and and it was so beautiful. Um, you know, when when Dave and I were talking the next day, he said, "Man, he said he said he said he kind of cracked open the universe," and uh, he said, "I knew who Charles Lloyd was." He said, "But I wasn't ready for that." You know, and he says, "I he said I didn't realize it was going to be like that." You know, and uh, so it was it was very powerful, and uh, and and you know, Charles was telling stories about like growing up in Memphis and playing the Chitlin circuit with Howlin' Wolf. <laughs> and I was like, come on, man, you're going to be kidding me. He told me a story about um, uh, Phineas Newborn Jr., Finest, he called him. Uh, and, and his brother, um, um, Phineas's brother, Calvin Newborn, was a bassist. And so they would play together. And, uh, and, and so, so Calvin, when he would play, you know, he'd be playing upright bass. But like all his his whole body would be wiggling, like he'd be kind of dancing from the from the waist down, you know. And he said, and, and here's the thing, he said, Elvis dug jazz. He says, but Elvis came to see Calvin. He says, Elvis got all his shit from Calvin Newborn, Phineas's brother. He said he stole all of Calvin's moves. He said he would see that the way women would react to Calvin. And so Elvis was a kid when he would come and see Phineas. And the trio and Charles and all these guys, right? But he was coming to check out Calvin. So Elvis got all his stuff, like a bunch of his moves from Calvin Newborn. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That is really wild. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, but so Charles had amazing stories. Stuff with Booker Little and moving to New York and, and the whole deal, man. You know, playing with Cannonball and yeah. Yeah. We're coming up against the time barrier here. I want to look at one more video before we say goodbye. Okay.
Wow. How'd you do that? Um, well, well, that's the uh, that's the Vanderbilt faculty. And f we released that on International Jazz Day a few days ago. Uh, it was five, six days ago, I guess, uh, April 30th. Uh, and it was a tune that I had written just a few days before that uh, for the ensemble, um, thinking that you know, we should have something for International Jazz Day. So basically, um, we built it from the bottom up. I demoed it out. Um, in Pro Tools here in my studio, um, just with a, a drum loop and uh, um, basically put the horns together, did a, a keyboard bass line and uh, sent it to the drummer. He put his stuff down, um, did some editing work, sent it to the bass player. Um, well, actually, the bass player just sent me his part because it's a repetitive part. Basically put the thing together and then just started farming it out to everybody. And when we were done, um, everybody just did a video of it. And uh, we had a student uh, named Josh Paris uh, actually put the thing together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Amazing what we can do with technology. This album has sure. absolutely I mean, flown by. I want to thank Jeff for joining us. No, Tomorrow, my you, guest bro. will be our mutual friend, Bob Mincer. Jeff, could you say a little something about Bob Mincer? Oh, man. One of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, and I actually... Uh, got reintroduced to him through you, Brett, many years ago. We had dinner out in Los Angeles one time. And, uh, yeah, Bob, uh, I mean, Jesus, man, he's one of the greatest saxophonists in history. And, uh, and he's one of the most beautiful cats, um, just the salt of the earth, man. And, and uh, his wife, Carla, his son, Paul, just, you know, such a beautiful family and, and uh, warm and giving um, I mean, I could go on and on about Bob and, and you know, fill up another hour, but uh, um, just suffice it to say that I, I love him dearly and, um, you know, I'm bummed I won't get to see him this year, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll get to connect next year again. And, and uh, oh, you're so, I'm so happy he's going to be on here tomorrow. I am too. Bob's a dear friend, incredible musician, yeah. teacher, uh, husband, father, and uh, like me, a dog owner. Thanks, yep. everyone, for joining us today. Come back tomorrow for Bob Mincer. Please go to jeffcoffin.com to check out what yes, he's sir. doing. We only yep. scratched the surface in terms of uh, everything that Jeff is, is, is into right now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, visit the website and listen to his music. And uh, please yep. stay put safe it up there for and stay healthy. Bye for yes. now.